Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're decided you've, delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a very challenging one entitled, In the Crucible with Christ. Hmm. This is lesson number four in that series for July 23 of 2022, entitled, Seeing the Goldsmith's Face. What? Seeing the Goldsmith's Face? What could that possibly mean? Well, as usual, we'd like to start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your guidance in the scripture, for all that we can learn, and even for the tough passages in scripture and the tough times that you take us through in our own lives. Help us now to see what it means to see the goldsmith's face. In Jesus' name, amen. So what is the goal of our Christian experience on this earth? Jim? Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. All of us then reflect the glory of the Lord with uncovered faces, and that same glory coming from the Lord, who is the Spirit, transforms us into His likeness in an ever greater degree of glory. American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Okay, and from the Bible Study Guide, Amy Carmichael took a group of children in a, to a traditional goldsmith in India. In the middle of the charcoal fire was a curved roof tile. On the tile was a mixture of salt, tamarind fruit, and brick dust. Embedded in, the, in this mixture was gold. As the fire devoured the mixture, the gold became purer. The goldsmith took the gold out with tongs and it was, and if it was not pure enough, he replaced it in the fire with a new mixture. Each time the gold was replaced, the heat was increased. The group asked, how do you know when the gold is purified? He replied, when I can see my face in it. Amy Carmichael, Learning yeah. of God, Fort Washington. <laughs> that's, a, that's quite, a, quite a, an example. And of course, that's where our the title for our lesson comes from. God is seeking to purify us, to refine us with gold, to transform us into his image. It's an astonishing goal, and it seems even more astonishing that the Christ-like character is developed in us only as we pass through life's crucibles. From the Advil Bible Study Good for Sabbath, June 16. Okay, so now let's pick some of those challenging verses. How do you understand these following words from Romans 8, 29? Carrie? Those whom God had already chosen, he also set apart to become like his son, so that the son would be the eldest brother in a large family. It's from the Good News Bible. And if you go back to Romans 8, we could have fun with that if we had a lot of spare time. Um, it's, first of all, it starts out, it sounds like it's talking about everybody, and then you follow through, and all of a sudden, those who are purified, those who are sanctified, go to heaven. And hold on. It can't be everybody, and so you have to figure out how this all fits together. This verse, if you took it by itself, almost seems like God has made this decision in advance. Does God just predestine us? No, we don't believe that. What does it mean? It means that God has the ability to see where we're headed in advance. Oh dear. So, will this time come when we are members of God's family? Will that happen while we're still here on this earth, or is that a prediction of when we get to heaven? Genesis 1, 27. So God created human beings, making them to be like himself. He created them male and female. Good News Bible. So clearly, back at the beginning, God already started with things in just the way he wanted them, right? So what has sin done to us? Well, he, he didn't want sin to come, did he? No. It was sin before Adam and Eve were created. That's correct. Yeah, not here on this earth. Well, the sin had migrated to this earth. Yes. In the form of the, the devil. So what has sin done to us? If we were exposed right now to the full glory of God, let's, let's think of this difficulty. The glory in which Adam and Eve enjoyed walking in the cool of the evening we would die immediately. How do we know that? Can you think of some passages in Scripture? 
What did he say to Moses? You can't see me. Can't see my face. Whatever. <laughs> what, did you, what does Ellen White say about the cross? If God had appeared everyone. there at the cross, everyone looking on would have been destroyed. So we would immediately die if God suddenly with all his glory appeared to us. So what has changed? Adam and Eve walked with that glory. God still keeps us alive on life support now. That's, what, that's our condition right now. But if he should leave us completely, we would also die immediately. So here we are, suspended in space, if you will. If God appeared to him, us too fully, we would die. If he left us completely, we would die. We're sort of suspended in space. How have we changed since the days of Adam and Eve? Notice these interesting words from Romans 3, 10 through 19, which are actually six passages from the Old Testament. Okay, starting with verse 10. As the scriptures say, there is no one who is righteous, no one who is wise or worships God. All have turned away from God. They have all gone wrong. No one does what is right, not even one. And that's, that's from, from Psalm, Psalm 14 and Psalm yeah. 53. Their words are full of deadly deceit. Wicked lies roll off of their tongues, from Psalms 5, 9. And dangerous threats like snakes poison from their lips, Psalms 143, verse 3. Their speech is filled with bitter curses, Psalms 10, 7. They are quick to hurt and kill. They leave ruin and destruction wherever they go. They have not known, not known, the path of peace, Isaiah 59, 7 and 8. Nor have they learnt reverence for God, Psalms 36, 1. Now I'm going to interrupt for a second. Do you think when Paul wrote these words down, he put those texts in there? <laughs> no. No, the, the yeah. verses and chapters had not been, cre had not been conceived yet, yes. I would say, for, for us to have quick reference to this little key text here, but think of Paul's mind. He had memorized the Old Testament, I'm sure. So he's just thinking of, he's thinking of these things. Boom, 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 boom. He doesn't have to stop. He just, there it is. Go ahead. Verse 19. Now we know that everything in the law applies to those who live under the law. In order to stop all human excuses and bring the whole world under God's judgment. So if it's God's plan for us to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, why is Jesus the only person so far who has ever lived on this earth without sinning? I mean, if that's God's plan for all of us, why is he the only one who has accomplished it? Shouldn't there be at least one person besides Jesus who has succeeded in doing that? Well, even Adam and Eve before... Yeah. I mean, they were perfect. Yeah. They failed at seemingly minor temptations. Yeah. He said some very nice things about Job, didn't he? And he said some nice things about Abraham and about okay. Moses. Well, the hundred, will the 144,000 living at the end of this world's history, as discussed in the book of Revelation, reach the place where we, or hopefully it's we, or they live at least for a short time without sinning? When he leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. Now, I wish we had time to go back and look at all these things and carefully line them up, line them up, but we would discover that Jesus doesn't leave the sanctuary in heaven until every person on this earth has already made up their minds, and then the report comes with the angels, go back to heaven and say, they have all decided. They've either decided for God's side or they decided for devil's side. And Jesus says, there's no reason for me to, to carry on. Everybody's made up their minds. And that's when he stops his intercessory work in heaven. The restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed and Satan is entire control of the finally impenitent. God's long suffering has ended. And this is Great Controversy 614, paragraph one. There is a core issue in the Great Controversy. It goes beyond the fact that some of us can be transformed to become more like Jesus. Tim? From the writings of Ellen White, the Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that 
he could solicit from his father for the exaltation of his people. The spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent, and without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries, and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. It is the spirit that makes effectual that what has been wrought out of the world's redeemer. Or excuse me, by the world's redeemer. It is by the spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the spirit, the believer becomes a partaker in the divine nature. Christ has given his spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. Of the spirit, Jesus said, he shall glorify me. The Savior came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of his love so that the sp spirit was to glorify Christ by revealing his grace to the world. The very image of God is to be rep reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection by the character of his people. Wow. When so, he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will reprove the world by, of sin and by righteousness and of judgment. And, and that's pre according, according from Jesus in the Gospel of John. Go ahead. Right. The preaching of the word will be of no avail without the continual presence and aid of the Holy Spirit. This is the only effectual teacher of divine truth. Only when this truth is accompanied by, excuse me, accompanied to the heart by the Spirit will it quicken the conscience or transform the life. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 671 and 672. Okay. Satan has claimed that if God would not interfere, every human being would choose his, that is, Satan's side. Satan has gone on to claim that it would be impossible for any human being to live a perfect life on this earth. Unfortunately for Satan, Jesus Christ proved that was not true by his life. He did not commit a single sin. I mean, there are three things that Satan was determined to do when Jesus showed up on this earth. The first thing he said, nobody, no human being has lived without sinning. We are going to get this child to sin. He failed. And then as he came down near the end of his life, he said, well, if I can't get him to sin, I'm going to make his life so difficult that he'll just give up and go back to heaven. He doesn't have to sin. He just has to abandon what he's here to do, go back to heaven. He failed on that one. Finally, when Jesus is dead and in the grave, he and all of the, his evil associates tried to keep that grave shut. They failed in that one too. So three failures, three major failures on the part of Satan. Anyway, moving on, Jesus Christ proved that was not true by his life. But Satan had claimed that Jesus was a special case and that no ordinary human being can live on this earth without sinning. You no, know, Jesus isn't just an ordinary human. Jesus has responded by saying, I'm sorry, God has responded by saying that not only would God prove that human beings can live without sinning on this earth, but also he would have an entire group of people at the end of this world's history, at the most difficult time possible, who will choose to follow his plan for their lives so fully that even when Satan is allowed full access to them as he was to Job, they will not fail God. Satan's final argument will be refuted. Notice these comments by God about Job. So Satan really does have a pretty good argument there. Yes. There's only one that's done this. Yep. You know, come on, God. You know. Where are your people? Yeah. Where are, you know, if your way is so good, where are your people? Mm-hmm. So. Uh, I wouldn't want to live on anywhere without God there. But if you took, if Satan saying, if God would just leave them, then mm -hmm. they would all turn to Satan. Well, Satan would have to do the same. He'd have to leave too. Then what would happen? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Good question. Yeah. The only way you can have that is with laws. 
And if you got laws, you got courts and mm -hmm. enforcers and prisons and. Well, notice these comments by God about Job. Is that? I think it's my turn, isn't it? Yeah. There was a man named Job living in the land of us who worshiped God and was faithful to him. He was a good man, careful not to do anything evil. Now that sounds pretty close, doesn't it? Sounds pretty good. Go ahead. Did you notice my servant Job, the Lord asked. There is no one on earth as faithful and good as he is. <coughs> he worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. That's from the Good News Bible. Why did almost no one in the time of Jesus seem to understand the message of Job or even quote him? Why were the Pharisees so much like Job's three so-called friends? Why was their picture of God so wrong? Do you remember what the conclusion was at the end of Job, Job 42, 7 and 8? After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. Wow. There's no question about the fact that even those of us who live under very difficult circumstances are to shine as lights. Jesus said in Matthew 5:16, in the same way your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. That's from the Good News Bible. From 1 Corinthians 4, 9, for it seems to me that God has given the very last place to us apostles, like people condemned to die in public, as a spectacle for the world of angels and of humanity. And I'm gonna interrupt for a second there. That word spectacle there in the Greek is theatros. So we're on a stage and the whole universe is watching us. No wonder we have stage fright. Yeah. <laughs> Ephesians 3, 9 and 10, again from the Good News Bible. And of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, that's by means of us, mm -hmm. the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. That's an education process, isn't mm -hmm. it? We're educating the universe. Yeah. Imagine yeah. yourself on the field in a massive football stadium. Doesn't matter what sport you're in, football, whether that's what we call soccer in this country or whether it's American football anyway, could be something else. Suppose that Satan and all of his followers are on one side in the bleachers and that God and all of his followers are in the bleachers on the other side. Both sides are watching you. To go back to that uh, previous uh, passage there, when I, some years ago I pointed out to a, a former pastor or a guy was a pastoral pastor at the time, that Jesus died for the benefit of the onlooking universe and the angels. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it couldn't be. So I quoted there, pointed out Ephesians 1, 9 and 10 and mm -hmm. uh, uh, first, excuse me, Colossians 1, 19 and 20 and yeah. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. And he read that. I stand myself corrected. <laughs> you know, it, here he'd been through the, he'd been a pastor, he'd been a, a missionary or other parts of the world. Theological training. And been through Andrews University and never picked up on that. It's a paradigm shift. Which side of the bleachers would have the most to cheer about? What does that tell you about yourself? One of the challenging facts about the great controversy is that we cannot see either of the two sides in this conflict. We don't know who's cheering and who's booing. Hebrews 11, 27. It was faith that made Moses leave Egypt without being afraid of the king's anger. As though he saw the invisible God, he refused to turn back. Good Notice those, as though he saw the invisible God. What does that mean? He didn't really see him, did he? No. 
What was the essence of Job's struggle? What did he not see? At the same time, what did he believe on faith despite all his trials? Job 23, 1 through 10. I, this is Job's words now, being accused by his, his uh, so-called friends. I still rebel and complain against God. I can't hold back my groaning. How I wish I knew where to find him and knew how to go where he is. I would state my case before him and present all the arguments in my favor. I want to know what he would say and how he would answer me. Would God use all his strength against me? No, he would listen as I spoke. I am honest, I can reason with God. Which, what's, what is Job basically saying? He's saying he's not doing very well with his three friends, is he? He wishes, he wishes he were dealing with God. He would declare me innocent once and for all. I have searched in the east, but God is not there. I have not found him when I searched in the west. God has been at work in the north and the south, but still I have not seen him. Yet God knows every step I take. If he tests me, he will find me pure. And there's our word, test which also can be translated in certain contexts, tempt. What kind of trials and troubles are we facing in our day? Could it be trouble with family members, the loss of a job, loss of a home, or a large financial loss? How could such trials help our Christianity? All of these things happened to Job, and yet he thought they were going to bring him closer to God. And his last day in the temple, before his crucifixion and death, Two parables are recorded what Jesus gave to his followers. First one's Matthew 25, 1 and 2. Is that my turn? Matthew 25, 1, and, 1 to 12. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Once there were ten ver women, excuse me, ten young women, who took their oil lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and the other five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any extra oil with them. While the other, excuse me, while the wise ones took containers full of oil for their lamps, the bridegroom was late in coming, so the women began to nod and fall asleep. It was already midnight when the cry rang out, "Here is the bridegroom! Come and meet him!" The ten women woke up and trimmed their lamps. Then the foolish ones said to the wise ones, "Let us have some of your oil." because our lamps are going out. No, indeed, the wise ones answered. There is not enough for you and for us. Go to the shop and buy some for yourselves. So the foolish women went off to buy some oil, and while they were, excuse me, and while they were gone, the bridegroom arrived. The five who were, already, excuse me, were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was closed. Later, the other women arrived. Sir, let us in, they cried out. Certainly not. I don't know you, the bridegroom answered. Good News Bible. So here's one of the challenges. Doesn't sound like a lot of mercy in that, does it? No, it doesn't. What does the oil in the parable represent? In what ways does the meaning of this story ch change, depending on whether you see oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit or the pos possession of character? What are the implications of this story for you if the oil represents the Holy Spirit or of a Christ-like character? So here's a couple of possibilities. If it represents the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one who makes it possible for, for us to obtain the changes in character that are necessary before we can pre be prepared for heaven. Or if it's talking about character, character is the name for the changes that the Holy Spirit makes possible. So I don't think it makes a big difference whether it's talking about the Holy Spirit or the results of the Holy Spirit's work. It's all part of the same thing, isn't it? Isn't all that a process of education? Sure. Of, that, it should be. Yeah. I mean, that's... Uh, and it ta education takes time, usually. It's not a, a, a radical... Yeah, you don't just... Like, you, you, you probably heard the story about the young boy who was ready for the first grade and his, Got, his mother got him up early and got him all cleaned up and dressed up nice and she escorted him to school and, you know, went through the first day and all the playing and all the fun so forth. They came home and was in, next morning his mother came and wake him up said, come on, let's get ready and go to school. I said, go to school? I did that yesterday. 
<laughs> I learned everything. <laughs> I learned everything I, everything I needed to know, right? Yeah. Jim, Jim, you keep talking about education. Are you a professional teacher? No, but I, I kind of fashioned myself. I've, I've learned some. We've been with Ken and, and Graham Maxwell for, what, 40-plus years? So we should all be teachers. Of course. Yes. Yeah. And the, way, so the purpose of education, so maybe you can keep the younger ones from having to experience some of the well, things we've had to experience. But and then, we just read a little while ago, Matthew 5, verse 16, we're all supposed to be lights. Yeah. That's, if you're spreading the light, you're teaching, aren't you? Yeah. Carrie, I think you have something to help add to that. I'm reading from Matthew 25, verse 31 <coughs> through 46. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes as King and all the angels with him, he will sit on his royal throne, and the people of all the nations will be gathered before him. Then he will divide them into two groups, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goal, goats. rather. He will put the righteous people on his right and the others on his left. Then the king will say to the people on his right, Come you that are blessed by my Father, come and possess the kingdom which has been prepared for you ever since the creation of the world. I was hungry and you fed me, thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you received me in your homes, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me in prison and you visited me. The righteous will then answer him, When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we ever see you a stranger and welcome you in our homes, or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? Visit you rather. The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you did this for one of the least important of these members of my family, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Away from me, you that are under God's curse, away to the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, but you would not feed me, thirsty, but you would not give me a drink. I was a stranger, but you would not welcome me in your homes, naked, but you would not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, but you would not take care of me. Then they will answer him, When, Lord, did we ever see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and would not help you? The king will reply, I tell you, whenever you refuse to help one of the least important ones, you refuse to help me. These men then will be sent off to eternal punishment, but the righteous will go to eternal life. The Good News Bible. Okay. So does that... <clears throat> We've talked about this before, but does that seeing the poor and needy and helping them, does that include the, the drug addict at the corner that's saying need money for drugs? That's, that's a real challenge. Need food? Need yeah. money for food, but actually it's money for drugs? Or should we I, judge? Or should we just give them money? Or should we... I have a good friend who... Um, sees people in the, in the parking lot at the, at the grocery store asking for money. He says, okay, you wait right here. I will go into the store. I'll come back with a, with a bag full of food. And usually they disappear. Yeah. Yeah. It's not well, the guy with the sign says, oh, I, 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 why lie? I just want a beer. He's got yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in this parable, what was the basis for the separation between the sheep and the goats? It seems that they were being separated based on their works. This does not mean that we are saved by works, but if we are saved, we will work because faith works. What is the best test of a person's character? Would it be what she or he does when she or he thinks no one is looking? Isn't that called integrity? Yeah. Doing what you should when no one's looking? When you think no one's looking? Yeah. As faithful Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we believe that there will be a time of terrible trouble coming. Do you think it is possible that you could be alive to see that day? Daniel 12, 1 through 10 says, The angel wearing linen clothes said, At that time the great angel Michael, who guards your people, will appear. Then there will be a time of troubles, 
the worst since nations first came into existence. When that time comes, all the people of your nation whose names are written in God's book will be saved. Many of those who are, have already died will live again. Some will enjoy eternal life and some will suffer eternal disgrace. It doesn't say they will suffer eternal, they will have eternal suffering, does it? No. The wise leaders will shine with all the brightness of the sky and those who have taught many people to do what is right will shine like stars forever. He said to me, and now Daniel, close the book and put a seal on it until the end of the world. Meanwhile, many people will waste their efforts trying to understand what is happening. Now you know how is that, that what? is it not good to try to understand what's happening? Yeah, it's talk, it, these, are, these are people who are searching all over the place trying to figure things out, but they're refusing to go to the Bible where the real answers are. Refusing to go to the true source. Mm -hmm. Verse 5, Then I saw two men standing by a river, one on each bank. One of them asked the angel who was standing further upstream, How long will it be until these amazing events come to an end? The angel raised both hands toward the sky and made a solemn promise in the name of the eternal God. I heard him say, it will be three and a half years when the persecution of God's people ends. All these things will have happened. I heard what he said, but I did not understand it. So I asked, but sir, how will it end? He answered, you must go now, Daniel, because these words are to be kept secret and hidden until the end comes. Many people will be purified. Those who are wicked will not understand, but will go on being wicked. Only those who are wise will understand. Okay. Good News Bible. So why does God give a revelation that's hidden? Is that a revelation? Why does he keep it secret? Well, it's certainly to be revealed at the right time. So why does he bring it up then? So what do you, what, how often do you tell your kids, there's a surprise coming. Oh, what is it, what is it, what is it, what is it, what is it? What is it? There's a surprise coming. When, 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 when? <laughs> you know, in the future. In the future. We don't know how to wait for the future, right? Well, we know from looking at the Bible and understanding here that he's talking about messages that would be fulfilled at the end of this world's history that were expounded on further in the book of Revelation, right? Notice that it is the wise who seem to know what is coming and are prepared. There's a time of trouble coming like nothing that has happened before in the history of our world. Why is it that the righteous are described as understanding while the wicked do not understand? Proverbs 1, 7. To have knowledge, you must first have refer reverence for the Lord. Stupid people have no respect for wisdom and refuse to learn. Good News Bible rather blunt. <laughs> yeah. Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Now, we've had lessons in the past talking about this word fear. That's another, another word that has various meanings in Scripture. What does it mean in this context? To be in Reverence. Awe. Yeah, reverence. to be in awe. Reverence, respect for the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge, it means to get, incorporate what you, everything you can about the yep. Holy One. What is it that could prepare us for what is coming? We need, a, we need to gain a knowledge of God, His character, and His laws that reflect His character in order to be changed by that knowledge and to become more like Him. How can we help each other to succeed in that goal? Is this something we need to do alone or, and by ourselves? Or is it something that we need to help each other with? Now there's a very interesting passage here in Ephesians 4, which we're going to look at in just a moment. And it talks about what God's plans were for the church, right? And what were they? Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, it was he who gave gifts he appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets. Now, do we have any apostles in our day? It depends upon definitions. Yeah. Okay, what does the apostle mean? 
Someone who goes out, isn't someone it? Someone who is sent, sent out. And La the word apostle is Greek. The Latin is missionary. Do we have any missionaries? Oh, yeah, we, we know about missionaries, right? So then we have apostles. And others are to be prophets. What's a prophet? Speaks for God. Someone who speaks the truth for God. Do we have any people who do that? Others to be evangelists. Now, we still use that word. We have, we have evangelists. Others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. So what's being implied here? Do we need apostles? Do we need prophets? Do we need evangelists, pastors, teachers? We need all of them, right? Oh, yes. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people. What is it, what's another word for mature in the Bible? Perfect. 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 Reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. That's what we're talking about, isn't it? Reaching Christ's full stature. Then we shall no longer be children carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ, who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together, and the whole body is, under, is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. And Gordon, your department, what do you, what, what's the purpose of the body? The purpose of the body is to support the brain. Yes, the exactly. Brain where we think and decide mm -hmm. and make wise decisions, hopefully. Okay. That's what a person is. As a man thinketh, so is he, isn't it? Yeah, right. So the whole, the whole body is there to carry the brain around, to protect it and to give it nourishment and so forth, to, to do the things that God wants us to do. And so then when you, a person ha loses the capacity to think and to do, then they are not. They're, yeah, they, they're, 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 they, they've ceased to be a, a real person. Yeah, I mean, they got a body, but yeah. there's no, nothing functioning. Uh, they can't uh, manipulate or... So as we suggested earlier, God is waiting for a group of people to represent him clearly and convincingly in the face of everything that Satan throws against them in order to demonstrate that people intention, intentionally will indeed choose God's side instead of Satan's side. But we need to grow up in Christ in order to do that. So that's a challenge. We're talking about how to grow up in to, be, to become like Jesus Christ. In fact, God intends for the entire universe to watch everything that has happened and is going to happen on this earth, especially the final events, to see if he is proving his point. So what's the rest of the universe doing? Watch. Watching the theater, right? And who's in the theater? Who's on the stage? Us. Beans. And watching to see whether God succeeds in his efforts or whether the Satan's going to get us all to fall and join his side. Okay, Ephesians 3, 9 and 10. Is that mine? God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that the present time, by means of the church, by means of what? The church. Who does that include? Us. That's us. By means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom and all its different forms. What could the universe possibly learn about? I mean, they have access to God, to God directly. What could they possibly learn about God from us? They see it in 3D animation, how, how th things work. How God deals with rebels. Yeah. How God deals with rebels, that's really, yeah. And, and as Jim said, how things work, and unfortunately how things don't work too. <laughs> had, had that, the sin problem never arisen, Intelligent creatures would really never have under, had the opportunity to relearn what the capacity of, of God's love is. Yeah, we, we, learned, we have learned a lot. 
Character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings. What does that mean? Our, our job is to prepare ourselves, well, not really prepare ourselves, to allow God to pr help prepare us for what's coming, right? And never before was its diligent study so important as now. Never was any previous generation called to meet issues so momentous. Never before were young men and young women confronted by perils so great as confront them today. Jim, there's your book, Education. Yep. 225, paragraph 3, yes? So, and when was this written? This was written the book over of education 100 years was, ago. Yeah, over 100 years ago. And, uh, you know. But now, 100 well, years in light of. Today, 100 years ago. Yeah, what would you say about us today? Oh. Wow. Well, when Jesus speaks of the new heart, he means the mind, the life, the whole being. To have a change of heart is to withdraw the affections from the world and fasten them upon Christ. To have a new heart is to have a new mind, new purposes, new motives. What is a sign of a new heart? A change to life. There's a daily, hourly dying to selfishness and pride. That's from the Youth Instructor, September 26, 1901, paragraph 5, but it's also found in the S.T. Bible Commentary, Volume 4, 1164. So, Jim, I'm going to turn to you next. Okay, Ellen White says, In the parable, the foolish virgins were represented as begging for oil and failing to receive it as their, uh, at, re the request. at their request. They were asking this, the others, weren't they? This is symbolic of those who have no, not prepared themselves by character, excuse me, by developing a character to stand in a time of crisis. It is as if they should go to their neighbors and say, give me your character or I shall be lost. Yeah, imagine that. Those that were wise could not impart their oil to the flickering lamps or to the foolish virgins. Character is not transferable. It is not to be brought, bought or sold. It is to be acquired. The Lord has given to every individual an opportunity to obtain a righteous character through the hours of probation, but he has not provided a way by which one human agent may impart to another the character which he, which he is, has developed by going through hard experiences, by learning lessons from the great teacher, so that he can manifest patience under trial and exercise faith so that he may so that he can remove mountains of impossibility. Ellen White, the use instructor, January 16, 1896. Yeah. You know, we, years, we were raised with, some of us, with the idea of imparted righteous, imputed righteousness. Well, let, let, me, let, let me bring that back down to earth a little bit. The Roman Catholic Church, and this is not, this is not secret, so I'm not telling any secrets here, they believe that people are saved based on their merits. And if you, aren't quite, you don't have quite enough merits, you can pray to the saints. And what the Catholic Church has a, a whole collection of saints, starting with Jesus is the most important one, and Mary is just behind him. And you can pray to these people, and they will, because they were so good, they have extra merits. And they can share some of their merits with you so that you will come out balanced enough on the good side so that the good balance in your life is more than the bad balance and, and the bad effect and so forth. So you can see Ellen White is specifically talking about that right here. You can't go to somebody else and get, can you get some of Jesus' character just by praying for it? No. You're, and the converse of that would be, Moving sins around, putting sins on this person or that yeah. person. I mean, it, the, some, what, what is that? Cognitive, cognitive dissonance that uh, mm -hmm. we were all exposed to? So what is character building? How do we accomplish that? How could character building be measured? What about in oneself? Or in your local church? <coughs> or in the world church? Do you agree with these words written by Helen Keller? who was deaf and blind from an early age? Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, vision cleared, ambition inspired, and success achieved. And that's from Leadership, Volume 17, Number 4. 
Imagine the lady who is deaf and blind has written 17 volumes, and there were more, on leadership. So what should be our goal in this over... What would she have done if she could see and hear? Yeah. Or would she have not, yeah. not developed so many things? Possibly. So what should be our goal in this overcoming purification process? The only standard that is safe for us to focus upon is, of course, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. <coughs> so what do we know about that? Hebrews 1.3 from Good News Bible. He reflects the brightness of God's glory and is the exact likeness of God's own being, sustaining the universe with his powerful word. After achieving forgiveness for human sins, he sat down in heaven at the right-hand side of God, the supreme power. Now I'm going to ask you a question about that, okay? We can't see God. We, 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 so long as we're here on this sinful world, we will not be able to see him. So who do we have to look to to be the representative of God? Jesus. What is, what is Paul trying to tell us here in Hebrews 1? He's a perfect example of God. If you want to know what God would have done, and we have often read a quotation here, uh, found in, in um, that I may know in page 338. If God had come instead of, if the Father had come instead of the Son, things would have not been one whit different. It was just exactly so. When the Son is common, he's, he's going to clearly represent the Father. What did Jesus say, in, I think it was in the upper room, when Philip said, we want to see the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. That's right. That's, that's the quotation. He was disappointed, right Ellen White says, to think, John I've been with you that this long, you still don't know what, what I'm doing here. John 14, 9, I think. Yeah. What did Paul mean when he said, after achieving forgiveness for human sins? What does that mean? Well, Sounds very forensic. Yeah. First Peter. Well, hold on. God, God is and always has been forgiveness personified. So does God need to change or does he have to, did Jesus have to come in order for God to forgive? Nope. Never. That is not something new that happened at the cross. Okay. Sorry, I jumped the gun there. All right. First Peter 1, 7. They're, in quotes, trials, purpose is the, their trials purpose. The trials purpose. Yes. Is to prove that their faith is genuine. Even gold, which can be destroyed, is tested by fire. So is your, and so your faith, which is much more precious than gold, must also be tested so that it may endure. Then you will receive praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. Okay. Is that to be our goal, though, to receive praise and glory and honor? No, but that's what will happen. Uh, what, what Jesus is really saying is that when, after the second coming, and really especially after the third coming, the, our work in heaven is, to, is going to be to travel throughout the universe and try to explain to all the onlooking universe and the answers to the questions that Jesus has provided to the plan of salvation. So, and we're giving glory to God by explaining these things to the onlooking universe. That's going, to, that's going to be our job for the rest of eternity. There's going to be new creatures being created. God's going to create new worlds and new beings and so forth like this. And God will say, you, I want you to go and explain to them what you learned from having lived here on planet Earth. So that's the way I understand it. So in this lesson, we have discussed four major issues. One, suffering plays an essential role in the process of character formation and purification. We don't like to think about that, but we've learned that. We will see that character formation is the restoration of the image of God in humans as they were created by God in the beginning, <clears throat> as well as the shaping of our characters according to the image of Christ. Three, this formation of character entails the theme of the cosmic conflict. What does that mean? It's another word for the great controversy, which is the conflict which began in heaven, which got 
metamorph down on, onto this earth, the conflict between God and Satan. And what is it about? It's about God's character and government. Do, is God's character, God's way of running the universe better or is Satan's way of running the universe better? And the, God's way is the way of love and Satan's way is what kind of way? Control. Selfishness. Yeah, yeah control. <laughs> So God and Satan, that it is in the conflict between good and evil, God and Satan, that we experience the crucible of maturity. Purification and maturity are never achieved by individuals in isolation. Rather, purification and maturity are achieved by individuals in communities. Is this true? Was it true of Jesus? So what is it saying here? We don't just sort of go off by ourselves as the hermits and, and sort of go into saints. No. We, we struggle with living in a, the, the life that we have to live in this environment, and, and that's the way we grow up to be mature. Why would this be true? We certainly are only saved as individuals, not as communities. We know that. Jim, I think that's yours. Ezekiel 14, verses 12 to 14. The Lord spoke to me, mortal man, he said, if a country sins and is unfaithful to me, I will stretch out my hand and destroy its supply of food. I will send a famine and kill people and animals alike. Even if those three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were living there, their goodness would save only their own lives. The Sovereign Lord has spoken. Good News Bible. See Ezekiel 18. Yeah, and there's a whole chapter that basically says the same thing. Notice these words from Ellen White. Carrie? The purification of the people of God cannot be accomplished without their suffering. God permits the fires of affliction to consume the dross, to separate the worthless from the valuable that the pure metal may shine forth. Can I interrupt for a second? When I came to medical school many, many years ago, the dean of the School of Medicine stood up in front of our class the very first day and said, 50% of what we're going to teach you is wrong. We just don't know <laughs> which 50%. Right. Right. So that, that's kind of what we're talking about here. God says, you know, you, 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 you experience, you're going to experience a lot of things that aren't good. You're going to learn things that aren't good. And so you've got to figure out what, which is good and which is bad. Okay, go ahead. If we cannot bear these trials, what will we do in the time of trouble? If prosperity or adversity discover falseness, pride, or selfishness in our hearts, what shall we do when God tries every man's work as by fire and lays bare the secrets of all hearts? True grace is willing to be tried. If we are loath to be searched by the Lord, our condition is serious indeed. God is the refiner and purifier of souls. In the heat of the furnace, the dross is separated forever from the true silver and gold of the Christian character. Jesus watches the test. He knows what is needed to purify the precious metal that it may reflect the radiance of his divine love. Now let me interrupt for a second. How does that actually happen in, in real life, in our lives? How does God separate the, the bad from the good in our lives? We, ultimately, he gives us materials of, to help us make choices. He gives us, and, okay. and he's, he doesn't impose it on us. We, yeah, no, we he doesn't. To, we have to choose. He doesn't force us. He presents us the evidence. I mean, where's the evidence? What is, what is the gift of the Holy Spirit that we talked about earlier? The most important thing the Holy Spirit has done for us down through the years is what? Give us the Bible. Give us the Bible, yeah. Inspire the Bible writers, yeah. So do we have a choice now, just a simple choice. Do we read the Bible and take it the way it re reads and, and try to understand it and struggle through the understanding it and talk with other people like we do here in our class, uh, trying to get a better understanding of things, or do we just put it up on the shelf and let it gather dust? That's a choice. So go ahead. God brings his people <coughs> to him by close testing trials, by showing him their own weakness and inability, and by teaching them to lean upon him as their only help and safeguard. Then his object is accomplished. 
They are prepared to be used in every emergency to fill important positions of trust and to accomplish the grand purposes for which their powers were given them. God takes men upon trial. He proves them on the right hand and on the left, and thus they are educated, trained, discipled. Jesus, our Redeemer, man's representative and head, endured this testing process. He suffered more than we can be called upon to suffer. He bore our infirmities and was in all points tempted as we are. He did not suffer thus on his own account, but because of our sins and now, relying on the merits of our overcomer, we may be victim in, this na in his name. Rather. Let me interrupt for just a second there. You see, there's a, an idea there, overcomers. What are they doing? They have extra merits they can share. Okay, go ahead. God's work of refining and purifying must go on until his servants are so humbled, so dead to self, that when called into active service, their eye will be single to his glory. He will then accept their efforts. They will not move rashly from impulse. They will not rush on and imperil the Lord's cause. Being slaves to temptations and passions and followers of their own carnal minds set on fire by Satan. Oh, how fearfully is the cause of God marred by man's perverse will and unsubdued, subdued rather, temper. How much suffering he brings upon himself by following his own headstrong passions. God brings men over the ground again and again, increasing the pressure until perfect humility and a transformation of character bring them into harmony with Christ and the Spirit of Heaven, and they are victors over themselves. That's from Testimonies wow. from the Church, Volume 4. We've looked at a lot of passages, and I put together this material, a lot of it's from the Bible study guide, but I, I wanted you to see that I'm not, it was not my ideas. These, these are ideas that are presented very clearly, and they, um, they're a challenge to us. We, we, sh we can't neglect them. Purification is a real experience that happens in real people, and we need to be a part of it. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a blessing it is to have your words before us, to have the benefit of studying them and sharing together and talking about them and sharing with them even in this program. Lord, we ask that many will, will, will see and hear and listen and experience what this is all about so that we may soon be prepared to stand through those very difficult times that are coming be ready to welcome you when you show up in the clouds is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.